This lecture is on the senses. Let's look at an overview of the senses. The sensory division of the peripheral nervous system is described as afferent because it carries information towards the central nervous system. Somatic sensations are typically perceived consciously. Somatic sensations arise from the skin, skeletal muscles, and the special sensory organs. Somatic sensations include touch, temperature, proprioception, sight, taste, smell, and hearing. Visceral sensations are typically not perceived consciously. Visceral sensations arise from the internal body organs, smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. Visceral sensations include pain, bloating, and distension. So nothing too pleasurable there. This illustration shows somatic sensory input and visceral sensory input. Somatic sensory input is consciously perceived from the receptors, such as from the eyes, the ears, and the skin. Visceral sensory input is not consciously perceived, and it comes from the receptors of blood vessels and internal organs, such as the heart. Sensory receptors respond to stimuli and send signals through sensory neurons toward the central nervous system. Most sensory neurons are unipolar. Exceptions include the bipolar neurons of the retina. The receptive field is the distribution area of the endings of a sensory neuron. Smaller receptive fields allow more precise stimulus location. It's kind of like a pinprick, right? Versus a more blunt object pressing against your skin. The pinprick is going to be more localized and produce a stronger sensation. Here are some example of sensory neurons. The first example is the unipolar neuron. This is the most common type of sensory neuron in the peripheral nervous system. The receptor may contain free nerve endings or encapsulated nerve endings. The information is then sent towards the cell body from a peripheral process that acts like an axon, except that it's coming towards the cell body. And then it travels towards the central nervous system via the central process, which is appropriately the axon. This is a bipolar neuron. The cell body has two processes coming off of it. And this is an example seen in the retina of the eye and also perhaps the inner ear. And then this is a peripheral sensory neuron where the cell is right next to the receptor. I actually don't know any examples of where this occurs. Receptor adaptation helps determine stimulus duration. Adaptation is the decreased sensitivity to a continuous stimulus. There are tonic receptors and phasic receptors. Tonic receptors are slow to adapt and thus continue to respond to stimuli. Examples are the head position receptors in the inner ear. Phasic receptors adapt rapidly and only respond to new stimuli. An example of phasic receptors are pressure receptors. This illustration shows rapidly adapting receptors, aka phasic receptors, versus slowly adapting receptors, aka tonic receptors. For phasic receptors, it's a group of receptors which show rapid decline in the frequency of discharge with constant stimulation. 
So examples are the Pacinian corpuscles. That generally senses like deep pressure. So they detect, number one, the onset of the stimulus, number two, the offset of the stimulus, and number three, the change of the velocity of the stimulus. So that's good. That means that like your skin is going to adapt to pressure so you're not constantly irritated. <laughs> and then we have slowly adapting receptors um, called tonic receptors. And these are a group of receptors which continues to discharge with constant stimulation. And this shows limited adaption. So they detect the onset of the stimulus and the duration of the stimulus. So examples for these are proprioceptors, which continue to discharge to help in equilibrium and the production of voluntary movements. So that's good. So they help keep you from falling down because every time, you know, you um, exhibit a stretch or something that might cause you to lose your balance, you know, these receptors are going to fire. They're not adapted to that. They're like, oh, God, don't fall. And then we have pain receptors, which continue to discharge to avoid injury. So that's good. So it says, you know, quit. It hurts. Baroreceptors continue to discharge, regulate arterial blood pressure so that our blood pressure remains constant. And then we have uh, chemoreceptors of the carotid body, which is um, probably in a blood vessel somewhere, and that's going to help to regulate, like, pH and stuff. Uh, here we see the joint capsule receptors and the muscle receptors and a hair receptor. So the joint capsule and the muscle will continue to fire. They do not adapt. So um, like that is gonna help maintain balance. However, the hair receptor and the Piscinian corpuscles um, are going to rapidly adapt. And they're just gonna like not pay attention to the stimulus anymore as long as nothing has changed. And it's not injurious. Receptors provide the central nervous system information about stimulus type, um, which is called the modality, the stimulus origin, which is its location, the intensity, and the duration. The modality is the type of energy transmitted by the stimulus. We have touch in this case. That's the modality. The location is the site of the body where the stimulus originated. So here we see the receptor field and it can change. Um, intensity is the response, amplitude, or frequency of action potential generation, and the duration is the time from the start to the end of a response. So this is the intensity, like the frequency of the stimulus, and then this is the duration. So this looks like it might be like a neural spike train, so this might be like a phasic adapter, and this is like um, a tonic adapter. So this one kind of just like relaxed, and this one continued to send stimuli. Let's look at receptor distribution. There are general sense receptors and special sense receptors. General sense receptors are distributed throughout the body. They include somatic sensory receptors and visceral sensory receptors. Somatic sensory receptors are tactile receptors of the skin and mucous membranes. They're the proprioceptors of joints, muscles, and tendons. Tactile receptors are the most abundant receptors in the body. And these will be largely basic. They will adapt. Visceral sensory receptors are found in walls of internal organs. They monitor stretch, chemical environment, temperature, and pain. So these will vary in their adaption. Special sense receptors are found in complex sense organs of the head. And there are five special senses. Olfaction, which is smell. Gustation, which is taste. Vision, sight. Um, auditory audition is hearing and equilibrium or balance.
All right, the stimulus origin refers to where the stimulus is coming from in terms of the body. Exteroreceptors respond to stimuli arising outside the body. Interoreceptors respond to stimuli within the body. Proprioreceptors respond to balance and coordination stimuli. So for exteroreceptors, responding to the stimuli arising from outside the body includes touch, pressure, pain, and temperature receptors. And they occur in the skin and most receptors of the special senses. Enteroreceptors respond to stimuli within the body, and this includes monitoring chemical changes, tissue stretch, and temperature. Enteroreceptors may cause us to feel pain, discomfort, hunger, or thirst. Proprioreceptors, which respond to balance and coordination stimuli, will be found in the skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, and ligaments, as well as the connective tissues covering the bones and muscles. So these will be tonic um, adapters, meaning they don't ever adapt. They will constantly respond to the stimuli as they um, are received, and that will help us to remain in a sense of balance and coordination. This is the illustration for proprioception. We saw this back in the chapter on the brain and with the cerebellum and everything like that. So agility, balance, coordination, that is all part of proprioception there. And then here is the vision. So that's gonna be part of that bipolar um, neuron, uh, hearing, and then smell, ah. Uh, that's probably what this little booger was, literally. Here we go. Smell cell. There it is. <laughs> and then we have taste, um, and then touch, free nerve endings, and Meissner's corpuscle, which we'll talk about these in a moment. So those are all coming from exterior, outside the body, stimuli. And then enteroreception is coming from stimuli within the body. So the organs, heart, kidneys, bladder, skin, uh, hormones, which are like chemoreceptors, immune cells, bone, intestine, stomach, and lungs. This kind of puts everything in a, a loop. You know, we always have that nervous system arc that we talk about. So we have um, sensory input integration, and then motor output. So let's see how it all ties together. Interoreceptors, let's follow them. So they're gonna travel through the peripheral nervous system along the sensory neurons in the peripheral ganglia. That's where the cell bodies will be. So these will be like um, unipolar neurons. And then they're gonna synapse with interneurons in the central nervous system and these are traveling along a visceral pathway. And then they are going to synapse with visceral motor neurons in the central nervous system, going down to the spinal cord, and they will go through um, peripheral motor ganglia because these are going to be autonomic. And remember, we have the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and both of them have ganglia. The sympathetic nervous system has like trunk ganglia that are near the spinal cord, and so their preganglionic fibers are generally pretty short. And then we have the um, postganglionic fibers that'll be very long and will synapse with basically every single organ system in the body. And that's for the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system will have long preganglionic fibers and they will pretty much travel to the organ that they synapse with. And within that organ is gonna be where the ganglia are found. And then the postganglionic fiber will connect to that particular organ and initiate a response. So interoreceptors will travel to the central nervous system for autonomic processing. And they will synapse with autonomic motor neurons and travel through a sympathetic or parasympathetic pathway, pathway to the effector organs, which are smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands, and even adipose tissue. Exteroreceptors and proprioceptors. Exteroreceptors, remember, is like touch, um, temperature pain, 
and then the special senses. Proprioceptors are going to be found in the muscle spindle fiber cells and uh, the Golgi tendon organs, and they're going to help maintain that balance and coordination. So these are going to go along a somatic pathway, and they are going to synapse with inner neurons in the central nervous system. And then they will travel through the efferent fibers. There's no ganglia, if you remember, in the somatic motor division. Uh, they go straight to the skeletal muscle fibers where they will initiate a rapid response. Stimulus modality means the type of stimulus that is received. Mechanoreceptors are going to respond to mechanical forces such as touch, pressure, vibration, and stretch. Thermoreceptors will respond to temperature. Photoreceptors will respond to light energy. Chemoreceptors will respond to molecules smelled or tasted, as well as changes in the blood or interstitial fluid. Nociceptors will respond to potentially damaging stimuli that result in pain. Here are the types of environmental stimuli, the modalities. So mechanical will be pressure, touch, motion, sound, vibration, gravity. Thermal will be heat, cold, or infrared radiation. Chemical will be individual types of molecules. And electromagnetic will include visible light, electricity, and magnetism. So those photoreceptors will be under that modality. Here's how the sensory information is recognized and carried to the central nervous system. First, there will be a local depolarization of the receptor. The stimulus will result in graded potentials in the membrane of the receptor. If the graded potentials are excitatory, then an action potential will be generated. And so in order to be excitatory, a threshold must be reached. If the threshold is reached, the action potential propagates towards the central nervous system. Once in the central nervous system, all sensory information except for olfaction, or the sense of smell, will be distributed through the thalamus to the appropriate centers in the brain. So recall that the thalamus is your sensory operator, except for the sense of smell. Here we see several different modalities. We've got um, pain, we've got stretch, and um, muscle spindle stretch, as well as tendon stretch. And these are going to travel up the somatic pathways because it's from the skin and skeletal muscles and tendons. And then it's going to the synapse with the thalamus and go to the somatosensory cortex because that's going to be where information from the somatic sensations will be initially processed. Let's look at tactile receptors in more depth. Here's what we'll talk about Pacinian and Meissner's corpuscles. Tactile receptors are the most abundant receptor in the body. They are mechanoreceptors of the skin and the mucous membranes. The receptors can be encapsulated or unencapsulated. So since they're mechanoreceptors, they're going to be responding to pressure, touch, motion, vibration, gravity, even sound. Uncapsulated tactile receptors are dendritic ends of sensory neurons with no protective cover. There are free nerve endings, root hair plexuses, and tactile discs. Free nerve endings are exposed ends of sensory dendrites. They reside close to the skin surface and in mucous membranes. They are mainly for pain and temperature, but also light touch and pressure. They may be phasic or tonic. So like if they are phasic, they will fade out and adapt if it's just normal pressure. But if they're tonic, like a nociceptor, they will respond to painful stimulus regardless.
Root hair plexuses wrap around the hair follicle. They are located in the deeper layer of the dermis and they detect hair displacement. They are phasic receptors. So generally when your hair moves, it will be recognized, but then it will adapt. Unless, you know, it's pulled and then it will, you know, be felt again. Tactile discs are flattened nerve endings that attach to tactile cells called Merkel cells that reside in the basal layer of the epidermis. The Merkel cells will respond to light touch and they are tonic respect, uh, receptors, so they will always respond to that light touch. They will not adapt. Here we see the uncapsulated nerve endings the free nerve endings, examples are exteroreceptors, interoreceptors, and proprioreceptors. They're found in most body tissues, most dense uh, in the connective tissues like ligaments, tendons, the dermis of the skin, joint capsules, and the periostea, which are around the bones. They're also found in the epithelia, the epidermis, the cornea, the mucosa, and the glands. And the stimulus that they respond to are temperature, uh, chemicals, pressure, mechanoreceptors, and then pain. Then we have the modified free nerve endings um, called the tactile discs or Merkel discs, and they are going to connect to the tactile cell, which is the Merkel cell. They are exteroreceptors, and they're going to be found in the basal layer of the epidermis, and they are going to be responding to light pressure, and they're tonic. They're going to be very slow to adapt. Then we have hair follicle receptors, uh, like in the hair plexuses. They are exteroreceptors, and they're found in and surrounding hair follicles. They are mechanoreceptors, and so they will... Um, figure out hair deflection and they're rapidly adapting, meaning they're phasic. And so generally you won't be feeling your hair, you know, unless it's moved um, suddenly. Then there are the encapsulated tactile receptors. These are neuron endings wrapped by connective tissue and neurolemocytes. If you remember, neurolemocytes are swan cells and they make the myelin sheath. We have Pacinian corpuscles, Ruffini corpuscles, and Meisner's corpuscles. Corpuscles means body, and the corpuscles are like small bodies. So Pacinian corpuscles are located deep in the dermis, the hypodermis, and some organ walls. They detect deep pressure, coarse touch, high frequency vibration. They are phasic receptors, meaning that they will adapt. Ruffini corpuscles are located within the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. They detect deep pressure and skin distortion and are tonic receptors, meaning that they will respond every time. The Meisner's corpuscles are located in the dermal papilla, especially in the sensitive regions of the body, such as the fingers and the feet. They will be um, involved in discriminative light touch allowing for the recognition of te texture and shape, hence their importance in your fingers. And they are phasic receptors. They will adapt over time. Mm-hmm. Okay, sorry. Um, let's take a look at the Meisner's corpuscle first. It always reminds me of a little potato. Uh, they are exteroreceptors in the dermal papilla of hairless skin, particularly the nipples, external genitalia, fingertips, soles of feet, and the eyelids. And so they will help to determine light pressure and discriminative touch, meaning that you can tell what the object is that you're feeling, and they are rapidly adapting. So once you lay your hand on something, you know what it is once you have felt it, but then it's going to adapt and you're not really going to notice anymore unless something has changed. Bacinial corpuscles are called lamellated, which is like they're, you know, covered in layers of 
the myelin, so it's like laminated, and many sheets, that's what lamella kind of means. They are exteroreceptors, interoreceptors, and even some proprioceptors. They're found in the dermis and hypodermis, the periosteum of the bones, the mesentery of the um, abdominal pelvic cavity, tendons, ligaments, joint capsules. They're most abundant on the fingers, the soles of the feet, the external genitalia, and the nipples. They are mechanoreceptors that will respond to deep pressure, stretch, and vibration of high frequency, so like deep pressure. And they are rapidly adapting. And so again, they will um, become used to the feeling unless something changes. Ruffini endings are exteroreceptors and proprioceptors found deep in the dermis, the hypodermis, and joint capsules. As mechanoreceptors, they will respond to deep pressure and stretch, and they are slowly or non-adapting. So anytime a Ruffini ending is stimulated, it is going to respond. Phantom pain is a sensation associated with removed body part and occurs following amputation of a limb. The patient will experience pain from the removed part. The stimulation of the sensory neuron pathway is remaining on the, will, will occur on the remaining portion. And it's because the cell body of the sensory neuron is still alive. And sometimes the pain level can be quite severe. And none of those sound like good feelings, burning, stabbing, shooting, and cramping. How horrible. Now let's take a look at special sensory receptors. Special sensory receptors are localized to specific organs within the head. They include the chemical sense of olfaction, gustation, the electromagnetic sense of vision, and the mechanical senses of hearing and balance. Let's look at the chemical senses first. Olfaction is smell, and receptors will occur within the olfactory epithelium of the nose. The chemical sensation of gustation is taste, and the receptors will occur within taste buds of the tongue. For electromagnetic sense, that's going to respond to light, and that will be vision. Receptors for vision will occur within the retina of the eyes. For the mechanical senses, they are hearing and balance. Um, hearing is sound waves, and receptors for hearing will occur within the cochlea of the inner ear. For the mechanical sense of balance, that's going to be um, like almost a proprioception, like equilibrium. And the receptors are going to occur within the vestibule of the inner ear. Let's look at the eyes. We're going to look at the eyes and the ears, starting with the eyes. Vision is our dominant sense. About half of the cerebral cortex is devoted to vision. Accessory structures are attached to or around the eye, and these include the six eye muscles that help move our eyes up, down, left, right, and we can rotate and roll our eyes. Our eyebrows, eyelids, eyelashes, conjunctiva, which is the mucous membrane of your eyes, and your lacrimal glands. The eye itself is located in the orbit of the skull and it includes the anterior and posterior chambers containing the sclera, cornea, aqueous humor, iris, pupil, lens, vitreous humor, retina, choroid, and optic nerve. Let's look at the accessory structures. The eyebrows are located along the supraorbital ridge, meaning they're above your eyes on that ridge of your orbits of the skull. They aid in nonverbal communication, like surprise, and they also prevent sweat from dripping into the eyes. When you recognize somebody, your eyelids usually raise. Eyelashes extend from the margins of the eyelids, and they prevent objects from coming into contact with the eye, and this initiates the blink reflex. The eyelids cover and protect the eyes shielding them from light. The lacrimal caruncle is located medially 
And a sty is an infection of a sweat or oil gland at the base of an eyelid. As far as the lacrimal caruncle, that's where um, tears will collect and eventually drain through the tear duct. Conjunctiva is the transparent epithelial lining of the eye and the lid surfaces. It contains goblet cells, which will secrete a, mu a mucus that moistens eyes and also has many blood vessels that nourish the sclera and has abundant nerve endings, so the eye is very sensitive. Pink eye is termed conjunctivitis, or the inflammation of the conjunctiva. Here are the accessory structures of the eye. We have the eyebrows, which help to prevent sweat from dripping into the eyes and also aid in nonverbal communication. This is the margin of the eyelid where the eyelashes occur and they will have hair plexuses attached to them and so they'll be very sensitive to objects that are coming near the eye. These are the eyelids. You have an upper and lower eyelid. We have the lacrimal caruncle, and so tears will collect here and drain through the tear duct. The sclera is the white of the eye. Cornea covers the area of the eye that lets light in, um, and the cornea itself being clear will let light in. And then the conjunctiva is going to be that mucous membrane that's keeping the eye moist along with tears. Uh, the goblet cells will secrete mucus. It will also contain the blood vessels that nourish the sclera and a lot of nerve endings. This is a good view of the conjunctiva. You can see that it's continuous with the skin, and so it's the mucous membrane because it's open to the outside, and it's continuous with the cutaneous membrane of the skin, so it has to remain moist. That's why conjunctivitis hurts so bad. If you've ever had pink eye, it's dry and irritating, and your eyes turn, well, pink. The lacrimal glands produces tears that are composed of water, sodium, antibodies, and lysosome, which is an antibacterial enzyme. Blinking, about 15 to 20 blinks per minute, will wash the tears over the eyes. Tears lubricate, cleanse, and moisten the eye, reducing eyelid friction, defending against microbes, and oxygenating and nourishing the cornea. The lacrimal fluid will drain into a lacrimal sac of the caruncles, and the lacrimal drains to the nasal lacrimal duct and should just go into the nasal cavity, and then you swallow the fluid without really noticing it. If there's excess lacrimal fluid that occurs during the process of crying, then the tears will flow onto the facial skin because they overwhelm the lacrimal sac and the nasal lacrimal duct, and there's too much to just flow into the nasal cavity. But that's also why when you are crying and boohooing, you tend to, you know, sniff because you've got all those excess sweet tears running into your nasal cavity. Bless your heart. So in step one, we see that the lacrimal gland is going to secrete the lacrimal fluid, which are the tears, and they will pass over medially towards the lacrimal caruncle, and then they'll go into the lacrimal sac and the lacrimal nasal, sorry, nasal lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity, and then they will drain, and you should swallow them generally without any notice. The eye is almost spherical. It's located in the skull's orbit and is padded by orbital fat. <clears throat> the interior of the eye contains two cavities, the anterior cavity and the posterior cavity. The cavities are named based on where they are located around the lens. The anterior cavity is located in front of the lens and the posterior cavity is behind the lens. The anterior cavity will contain the aqueous humor, which is a watery fluid that nourishes the interior cornea and the lens. If the aqueous humor builds up, then a condition called glaucoma can occur. And this can put pressure on the eye and damage um, 
the structures for vision. The posterior cavity is located behind the lens and it contains a permanent vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is a jelly and aids in maintaining intraocular pressure along with bending light to focus it on the retina. If you have air pockets in the vitreous humor, they can result in floaters, which are little dark spots that you see in front of your eye. And light is not able to pass through those floaters and get to the retina. That's why they appear to block your vision. And they don't ever go away. And the reason they float is because the vitreous humor is kind of moving around. And so every now and again, the floaters will get into your field of view. <laughs> Sometimes they're bringing on the peripheral and you won't notice them as much. I'm a bird watcher and sometimes I have bird watched my floaters. I've seen, looked up in the sky and thought it was a bird, but it was just my eye jelly floaters. That was embarrassing. Here we see a view of the eye. Um, the anterior portion is in front of the lens and the posterior portion is behind the lens. So let's follow the pathway of light through the eye. It's going to come through the cornea first and then pass through the aqueous humor and go through the pupil to the lens. The lens is then going to bend the light so that it passes through the vitreous humor, which will help, you know, contain that bending. And the goal is to hit this part of the retina, which is the fovea centralis located within the macula lutea. The most cones are in this area, which is cones is for color vision and your sharpest vision. So that's where we want our light rays to hit. The iris is a group of muscles. There's two of them that will open and close the pupil as needed. When the pupil is open, it's dilated. When it's closed, it's constricted. The lens is going to stretch and bulge as needed to bend the light, depending on whether you're focusing for far vision or close vision. We'll talk about that in a moment. Um, this is gonna be the scoroid, which is the vascular layer that nourishes the retina, which is the, neur uh, the neural layer containing those rods and cones. All around the eye is gonna be the sclera, which is the hardened outer surface that helps the eye maintain its shape and connects to the skeletal muscles that move the eye up, down, left, right, and rotate and roll your eyes. And then we have the optic nerve, which is a continuation of the retina, and that will send the visual signals towards the brain. Eye wall is formed by three tunics. Tunics means, you know, a layer, a sheath, a covering. We have the fibrous tunic, the vascular tunic, and the retina. The fibrous tunic is external and is composed of the sclera and the cornea. Here we see the fibrous tunic, the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is the tough white of the eye and supports the eye shape. The cornea is clear and serves as a window so that light can pass through. It also bends light. The vascular tunic is the middle layer and it contains the choroid, ciliary body, and the iris. So this is the choroid here. These are the ciliary bodies and there are some ligaments that will connect to the lens and then the iris. The iris is the part of your eye that you see that's colored. So the choroid contains vascular tissue to nourish the retina. It also contains melanin to absorb excess light. The ciliary body contains tendons that change the shape of the lens to accommodate for seeing far or near. And the iris contains the pigment of the eye along with the smooth muscles that dilate and constrict the pupil. So the more pigment you have, the more melanin you have, the darker your eye. The less melanin you have, the lighter your eye. And it serves the same function as it does in the skin and the hair. It helps to protect from UV radiation. So the lighter your eyes, the more susceptible you are to UV radiation. And um, sunshine will hurt your eyes if you've got light eyes. 
The retina is the inner layer, and it is uh, containing two layers of its own, a pigmented layer that will attach to the choroid, and it contains vitamin A, which nourishes photoreceptors. So you've always heard, eat your carrots, they're good for your sight. And that's because carrots are high in retinoids, uh, such as beta carotene, which does help to nourish the photoreceptors. The other layer of the retina is the inner layer called the neural layer. And this contains the photoreceptors, which are rods and cones. The rods help you to see motion and the cones help you to see color. Here we see the choroid or the um, cornea and the sclera as part of the fibrous tunic. The vascular tunic contains the iris, and here you see that it's pigmented blue because it has less melanin in it. We have the ciliary bodies and the choroid. And then the retina has the um, pigmented layer that connects to the choroid, and then the inner neural layer that contains the rods and the cones. Here's how the iris will constrict the pupil with bright light and it will contract the pupil or dilate the pupil in dim light. And so the more closed the pupil is, um, the less light is going to come in. And the more open the pupil is, more light will come in. The neural layer of the retina will form three sublayers. We have the photoreceptor cell layer, the bipolar cell layer, and the ganglia cell layer. So the photoreceptor layer is the outermost neural layer. It contains the rods and the cones. Rods are activated by dim light and can detect motion. Cones are activated by bright light and detect color and sharp vision. So here's that outer layer of the... Um, neural layer of the retina, there's the pigmented layer that touches the choroid. And rods and cones are named based on the way they look, their shape. So these are the rods, and then these are the cones. And I remember cones for color. And then we have the middle layer, which will be the bipolar cell layer. And the receptors will receive the inputs from the rods and the cones. And then they will send them to the ganglion cells. So these look a lot like the ones that we saw in the picture as well, similar to smell. And the ganglion cells will receive input from the bipolar cell and they will eventually form the optic nerve. Uh, the optic nerve will cross over at the optic chiasm and it will pass through the thalamus and then on to the visual cortex. Here we see the rods and the cones. Rods for dim light and motion, cones for color and sharp vision. Then they pass the information to the bipolar cells uh, and then to the ganglion cells, which also look to be bipolar, but not, um, you know, with the cell body right in the center. The cell body is nearer to the dendrites. And then the axons are going to go ahead and migrate towards the optic nerve. So incoming light comes in, boom, it hits the photoreceptors and is then absorbed by the choroid and the pigmented layer of the neuron of the retina. And then the information, the nerve signal, is gonna go from the rods and cones through the bipolar cells to the ganglion cells. Components of the retina also includes the optic disc, the fovea centralis, and the peripheral retina. The optic disc occurs where ganglionic axons converge into the optic nerve. It doesn't contain any photoreceptors and is thus considered your blind spot. The fovea centralis is located within the macula lutea. There's the highest pore portion of cones and hardly any rods in the fovea centralis, and thus this is the area of sharpest vision. Some animals that are really good hunters have two fovea centralises, like falcons and stuff, and that is the way they can pinpoint birds and whatnot flying, and they can catch them in midair. 
the peripheral retina, sorry, contains primarily rods. And so this functions most effectively in low light. Here we see the fovea centralis of the retina and the macula lutea is the area that the fovea centralis is in. So macular degeneration will be the breakdown of this area of the retina. And since it's going to also degrade the fovea centralis, your central most, you know, sharpest vision is going to blind you. And all you'll be able to see is peripheral. And so you're functionally blind with macular degeneration. This is the optic disc. You can see that there are no um, rods or cones here. So this is going to consist of ganglion cells that are merging to form the optic nerve. So this is a blind spot. And you can check your blind spot. You did that in the lab activity, but when you close your left eye and stare at the black dot with your right eye, as you move closer, the plus sign will move over the optic disc of your right eye and seem to disappear. Your brain may even fill in the lost image with the black dot. Oh my gosh, mine happens even on the computer screen. It totally works. I just did it if you couldn't tell. All right, <clears throat> here are the wavelengths that the cones see. So we have blue cones, um, we've got green cones, we've got red cones. And so when you have like red green blindness, which is very common, these are the cones that are affected. You're either lacking those cones due to genetics, which is basically what happens. And it usually happens more in men than it does in women. Binocular vision is extremely important, and it occurs in animals that have the eyes that are in the front of their head. And if you see out of the left eye only, that's monocular. If you see out of the right eye only, that's monocular. And so some animals will have their left and right eyes kind of far on the side of their head. And they got a lot of peripheral vision, but they don't have as much stereo vision. They don't have like the 3D vision that we have because of their monocular vision basically being constricted to the right and the left, vice versa, sorry, right, left. <clears throat> All right, so let's take a look at each one of these structures and trace the pathway of light as it goes from eyeball to brain. The retina has the photoreceptors and neurons in the retina that process the stimulus coming from incoming light. And they will join into the optic nerve, those ganglionic cells, and then they will exit the eye and enter the brain. The optic chiasm is where optic nerve axons are going to cross. And so the medial axons will cross here. Notice that the red and blue from the medial optic nerve. The lateral axons on the optic nerve will remain traveling ipsilaterally, meaning they won't cross over. They'll stay on the same side of the brain. This is what really gives us that depth perception, that stereo vision. And we depend on our eyes being in front of our heads to do that. The optic tract is going to contain axons then from both eyes. And these axons will project to either the thalamus or the midbrain, which I didn't know that. That's new to me. Um, and we'll learn about that here. <laughs> and so um, the thalamus, of course, then will send it. Let's go ahead and jump down from what the thalamus is going to do. The thalamus will send the visual information to the primary visual cortex of the occipital lobe. So let's see what happens to what goes to the midbrain. So here we have the pretectal nucleus of the midbrain and the superior colicus, oh yeah, durr, I teach about this in lab. This is your visual reflex center. Ha <laughs> ha, so this is where it goes. <laughs> See, even as a teacher, light bulbs go off all the time. <laughs> all right, the lens is composed of translucent protein and it changes shape to focus light. The shape will be determined by the ciliary muscle, and suspensory ligaments. When viewing objects 20 or more feet away, the lens will be flattened 
and the light rays are not sharply bent. This will be the lens's natural state. So the, hence, I guess, 20-20 vision, right? That's why we measured at 20 feet, because that's our natural state of our eyeball lens. When viewing objects closer than 20 feet, accommodation occurs. The lens becomes more spherical and the light rays will be sharply bent. As you get older, you lose the ability to accommodate and presbyopia will occur. And that's when you have to get bifocals and readers and you have to hold things farther away from your face because you can't see. Also, if you've ever noticed, if you've had your pupils dilated for an eye exam, you cannot see close up. Because um, when your pupils are dilated, um, it is affecting the way the light is bent in your lens. So here we see the ciliary muscles relaxed and your pupils will also be dilated actually because it's gonna let more light in and the um, light will not bend very sharply when your uh, muscles are relaxed. And so this is for distant vision. That is our natural state. And if you think about it, it makes sense that our natural state would be to scan our horizons and look around us for any signs of danger. And this is the goal. We want to make sure that our light rays are going to hit the macula lutea and fovea centralis of the retina. This is what happens when we are looking up close and we're accommodating. So our ciliary muscles will um, cause our lens to bulge in the way that it does, rounding it out, and that is gonna bend the light more sharply. And generally, in this case, our pupils are going to be less dilated. They're going to be um, constricted. And so less light comes in and less light is bent and we're able to see up close. So <laughs> when you get your eyes dilated, you're kind of in a bad state and you can't see very well. So that's why they say rest for, you know, 45 minutes or so after your eye appointment before trying to drive. There are common vision disturbances. Emetropia, you luckies, are normal vision. And some of y'all do have normal vision, and I have never had normal vision, so I don't understand it at all. So your light rays come in parallel, and they focus perfectly on your retina. The rest of us have problems. We could be hyperopia, myopia, or astigmatism. If we're hyperopia, we are farsighted, and we cannot see up close. Our eyeballs are too short. It's corrected with convex lenses that sharply bend the light. So these are like the thick bottle cap lenses. Myopia is one of the more common and that's nearsighted. So we can't see far away. Our eyeball is too long and it's corrected with concave lenses that extend light. So luckily the lenses there are a little bit thinner. And then astigmatism is an unequal focusing because there is unequal curvatures on one or more refractive surfaces. And refractive means to bend light. And so either the cornea is messed up or the lens is messed up. Usually it's got something to do with uh, one of those objects. Astigmatism is one of the most expensive to treat because you have to get special um, prescriptions that can, you know, even out those unequal services. So here's an emetropic eye. It's a normal eye and your eyeball is the perfect shape. And when light rays come in from 20 feet, this is what they look like. They come in nice and parallel through your beautiful cornea and your nice, you know, relaxed lens. And look at how beautifully the light is bent and it hits directly at the focal plane on the macula lutea and fovea centralis. And then here is someone who is nearsighted. Our eyeballs are too long. And so at 20 feet distance, the light rays are coming in parallel and they're 
you know, starting off all nice and good, going through a cornea and a relaxed lens, just like they should. And they go and they hit what should be the focal plane. But alas, the eyeball is too long. And so then they spread out again. And by the time they hit the macula lutea and fovea centralis, your vision is blurry. Another thing that is an issue with having your eyeball too long is everything is stretched. And so your vitreous humor is stretched, your retina is stretched. And so um, nearsighted folks are at more of a risk for tears in the retina and like floaters in the vitreous humor and even retinal detachment. So that's scary. But the bright side is, is thin glasses tend to um, correct that because the concave lens will move the focal point further back because it's going to spread the light rays back out before they hit the lens instead of the light rays coming in parallel. Now let's take a look at um, hyperopic eye or fire, farsighted. So the eyeball is too short. So at 20 feet, when they're looking at the chart there, the light rays are parallel and they're coming in like they should, all nice and pretty through the cornea and the lens that's relaxed. And then they're traveling on their way to hit the focal plane at the macula lutea and fovea centralis. But alas, the eyeball is too short. And so the eyeball ends before the focal plane would occur. And so the vision is blurry, particularly when trying to see, you know, 20 feet or further away. And so these big old convex lenses are going to go ahead and bend the light prior to entering the cornea and the lens. And that's what's going to help it hit the focal plane a little bit earlier. So even though the glasses may be thicker, the folks with farsighted eyes are, you know, going to be at less risk than the nearsighted folks for retinal detachments and floaters and the vitreous humor and all that good stuff because the eyeball is too short and everything is kind of just like, you know, um, smooshed in there rather than stretched out and tearing. It's like Goldilocks. Your eyeball is too short or it's too long, but we need it to be just right to be emotropic. And thank goodness for glasses. I know I am this one, and I've actually got my retina shredding. <laughs> I get it checked when I go to the doctor because it is tearing, and so I'm like, mm. and um, so I gotta be careful not to jar around and shake my head too much and get on roller coasters and stuff anymore because I don't wanna go blind. But I do have to wear my glasses because honey, I can't see at all. Even nearsighted, I can see maybe like six inches in front of my face. It's not very, it's not very good. This is what happens with astigmatism. So here we see the cornea is oval shaped rather than sphere shaped and normal. And so light is coming in at all different kinds of focal points. And that's why it is expensive to treat astigmatism with contacts and glasses, but it can be done. They just have to go in and basically get your bifocals. All right, so the last thing that we'll talk about is the ears and hearing and equilibrium. So the ear will detect sound and head movement. There are three major structural areas of the ear, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The external ear will direct sound waves into the external acoustic meatus, which is your ear canal. And the external ear will contain the auricle, which is the cartilage that makes up the ear, the external acoustic meatus, which is your ear canal, and the tent panum, which is your eardrum. And if you've ever heard of timpani, that's a drum. The middle ear receives sound waves and transfers them into vibrations. And the middle ear contains the middle ear ossicles, or the little middle ear bones. These are the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The inner ear will receive vibrations and transforms them into nerve impulses. It is also the site of equilibrium. And so the inner ear contains the vestibule for equilibrium and the cochlea for hearing. It also contains the saccule. We'll see that this equilibrium part is actually made up of the vestibule and the saccule. 
So here we have the external ear, and this is the auricle. So it contains the cartilage and the earlobe. And then this is the external acoustic meatus. It's the opening in your temporal bone that lets the, ear, the sound waves come in. They travel through the external acoustic meatus or ear canal and hit the tympanic membrane and vibrate it. Then the vibrations are transmitted to the middle ear. And these are the three ossicles, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. And they vibrate and transmit the sound waves to the inner ear. So this is going to be the oval window. And this will um, jiggle the jelly inside the inner ear here. And it will travel through this um, cochlea. And the organ for hearing is inside that. It's called the spiral organ. Hence the spiral. And then these are the vestibule and the saccule. And this is going to be where the equilibrium will be maintained. And then we are leading from the vestibule and the cochlea into cranial nerve number eight, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve. Sound waves are captured by the auricle and directed towards the external acoustic meatus. Sound waves travel through the ear canal and strike the tympanum, which vibrates when struck by sound waves. The vibrations transmit the energy to the auditory ossicles. The malleus is named because it resembles a hammer, and that's what malleus means. Incus means anvil, and stapes is stirrup. The ossicles will transmit the vibrations to the oval window, which is the entrance into the inner ear. So here we have the tympanic membrane and then the middle ear ossicles. One thing to take a look at is the eustachian tube. And notice that it goes down and that helps to drain like excess fluid from the middle ear and then, you know, into the pharynx uh, to swallow. And <clears throat> in children, this tube does not extend downward yet inferiorly. Instead, it is going to be medial and go towards the nose. And that's why young children are going to be more susceptible to middle ear infections and will need like, you know, drains put in um, surgically if they are succumbing to chronic middle ear infections. And then once we hit the oval window, we're going to see what happens when the um, sound waves vibrate and pass through the cochlea and the interior spiral organ. The inner ear is housed within the temporal bone, and it has three major regions, the cochlea, the vestibule, and, oh, sorry, I kept saying saccule, but I should have said semicircular canals. My apologies on that. Uh, the cochlea will contain the cochlear duct, which houses the spiral organ, which is the organ for hearing. The vestibule will contain two sac-like membranes, the utricle, and there's the saccule, which will detect static equilibrium and linear movement. We'll talk about that in a moment. The semicircular canal will connect to the vestibule and it contains membranous semicircular ducts that detect rotational movement. So just stay tuned for that. That's pretty wordy, but we'll get to explaining that in a second. <clears throat> this is the vestibule here, <coughs> and this is the semicircular canals. Um, the vestibule is going to have the saccule and the utricle <laughs> and basically linear movements mean when you are leaning your head to the side so if you take your ear towards your left shoulder and then you take your right ear towards your right shoulder um, and then if you move your face forward or backwards in space that's what the vestibule is recording and then for the semicircular canals, these guys are going to be recording the rotational movement. So when you're spinning around in circles or turning your head, rotating it side to side, um, which you do with your atlas and your axis when you are rotating your head like you're saying no. This is the spiral organ inside of the cochlea, and this is where the hearing will take place. And then again, our vestibular cochlear nerve. The spiral organ is a thick sensory epithelium within the cochlear duct. 
It consists of hair cells resting on the basilar membrane. And the reason it calls it the cochlear duct is because it's the passageway that moves through the cochlea. The cochlea is basically this, um, you know, kind of spiral-shaped uh, entity, you know, and it contains all of these other type of organs. So here we see cochlea is the whole thing. And then we have the cochlear duct, okay, which is going to be a passageway in the cochlea. And then we have the spiral organ. So the spiral organ is going to contain hair cells resting on a basilar membrane. And if you remember, epithelium will have like a basement membrane that those epithelial cells connect to. Uh, there will be hair cells on the spiral organ, and they will contain stereocilia and kinocilia. Stereocilia is going to be long microvilli, and the kinocilium is going to be one long cilia. The base of the hair cells will synapse with the cochlear nerve. So here's the pathway from the sound waves to the nerve signals. Sound waves will vibrate the tympanic membrane. The ossicles in the middle ear will vibrate and transmit waves to the oval window. Pressure waves will vibrate within a scala vestibuli, which we'll look at. It's, it's part of the um, cochlear duct. Specific regions of the basilar membrane will move depending on the sound wave frequency. And the sound waves will trans, uh, travel through the cochlear duct and distort the uh, basilar membrane. Hair cells are stimulated and send auditory information to the cochlear nerve, and then pressure will be released from the inner ear through the round window. So these are the steps. Number one, the sound waves will vibrate the tympanic membrane. Step two, the auditory ossicles will vibrate and the pressure will be amplified. Step three, pressure waves created by the stapes will push on the oval window and move through the fluid in the scala vestibuli, which is part of the cochlear duct, or it's around the cochlear duct. And then in step 4a, the sounds with frequencies below hearing travel through something called the helicotrema, which is the um, tip of the cochlea, and they do not excite the hair cells. In step 4b, the sounds in the hearing range will go through the cochlear duct vibrate the basal membrane, and deflect hairs on the inner hair cells. Number one here in this picture is going to trace the pathway of the auditory signals to the brain. So in step one, the movement of the basal membrane produces nerve signals that are propagated along the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve 8. They go towards the cochlear nucleus within the medulla oblongata. And some secondary neurons in 2A are going to relay nerve signals directly to the inferior colliculus of the midbrain. Right there. And in step 3, the nerve signals will be relayed from the inferior colliculus to the thalamus. And then, step four, the nerve signals are relayed to, from the thalamus to the primary auditory cortex of the temporal lobe of the cerebrum for sound perception. So look at that midbrain being important in both hearing and even vision. All right, deafness is any type of hearing loss. It could be conductive deafness or sensoneural deafness. Conductive deafness is the interference of the wave transmission in the external or middle ear. So, you know, you could have too much earwax for real, and it can muffle the uh, ability of your eardrum to vibrate. Um, then you have sensorineural deafness, which is a malfunction in the inner ear or the cochlear nerve. One of the most common types of hearing loss is high frequency hearing loss because the cells for hearing for high frequencies are going to be the ones that are hit by the vibrations first. And so thus, you know, loud and noxious 
sound waves are going to damage those cells because those are the cells that are hit first. And high frequency hearing loss can, you know, lead to like tinnitus as well. Okay, lastly, let's talk about equilibrium. Equilibrium is the awareness and monitoring of head position. Here's where we have the vestibule and the semicircular ducts. So the vestibule will detect static equilibrium and linear accelerate acceleration. So static equilibrium, like your head is still in space. And then linear acceleration, like I said, take your left ear and move it toward your left shoulder. Now take your right ear and move it toward your right shoulder. And then, you know, move your face forward. Now move your face back. The vestibule is going to detect all of that movement. And the sensory receptor within the vestibule is called the macula. It's going to contain hair cells, like with the stereocilia and kinocilium, but they're connected to otoliths, which literally mean ear rocks. Then we have the semicircular ducts, and they are going to detect rotational acceleration. So recall, if you're nodding or you're rotating your head, yes or no, uh, oh, if you're rotating your head, no. If you're yesing, you're nodding, and that's going to be these guys, static equilibrium and linear acceleration. But it's rotational that is going to be the semicircular ducts, and the sensory organ of the semicircular ducts is the crista ampullaris. And again, it's going to contain the otoliths or the ear rocks that will be connected to stereocilia and kinocilia. So when our hairs bend, as we're moving our head in space, um, they're going to, you know, pull on, or the, the crystals will move and pull on the hairs, which bend them, and that's going to send those signals to the brain for processing. Vision and proprioception also help us maintain our balance. Sometimes your vision and the movement of the otoliths and the nerve signals through the vestibular part of the vestibulocochlear nerve do not match up. And that can lead to nausea and dizziness and vertigo. There are some folks who suffer from vertigo, and <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but they can actually go, doctors can realign the otolith in your ears when you are having bouts of vertigo. And sometimes to manage vertigo, you can actually regularly go and get your otolith realigned, um, but it's definitely a specialist who's gonna be able to do that. This is what the macula look like, and here is the hair cells that have the stereocilia and then the large kinocilium. So from what I understand, and we're going to see it here, the kinocilium is the one that actually, you know, really sends the, hair, uh, the, the signals to the nerve. So let's look at what's happening. Nerve impulses will be generated in the vestibular fiber. So we see that, you know, there's low frequency, and then we get high frequency, which will lead to depolarization and an action potential. So we are facing our patient, so that means that they are bending their head to the left. Boink! So when the hairs bend towards the kinocilium, the hair cell depolarizes, exciting the nerve fiber, which generates more frequent action potential. So see how the kinocilium is on the left here? So as you're bending your head left, the kinocilium on the left is um, going to bend, and the hairs will bend towards it, and the nerve signal will be depolarized. And then when you bend your head to the opposite side, the kinocilium is going to bend to the right. And hairs will bend away from it, and this will hyperpolarize the nerve fiber and decrease the action potential frequency. And then this is what the ampulla looks like in the semicircular canals. And you can see where this would be for rotation, and that's exactly what's happening. As you rotate, do I have the image? Yep. So at rest, the copula, which is in the um, ampullaris, is going to stay upright. During rotational acceleration, endolymph, which is the fluid inside the ear, is going to move inside the semicircular canals. 
And this is going to be, you know, some Coriolis effect stuff, but it's going to rotate in the opposite direction of your movement. And it's going to bend the hair cells and excite them. And then as rotational movement slows, the endolymph will keep moving in the direction of the rotation. Again, physics and Coriolis effect and all that. And it will bend the cupula in the opposite direction and inhibit the hair cells. So it's going to be, you know, based on where those kinocilium are bending. So the kinocilium, whichever way the hair cells bend towards the kinocilium, that's going to be what ends up signaling the nerve. So you don't have to understand, like, the physics behind all that. I know I don't. But it's just neat that you've got these otoliths, these rocks that are floating around in your ears in this jelly. And, you know, as the rocks kind of slide and move, um, you know, the kinocilium and the stereocilia will follow. And that's going to tell your brain where <laughs> you are in space, where your head is. And so equilibrium pathways to the brain occur when signals from the macula or crista ampullaris are conveyed by the vestibular nerve and they terminate in the medulla oblongata or the cerebellum. Uh, the medulla oblongata helps control the reflexive eye movements and balance and the cerebellum helps coordinate balance and muscle tone. Ooh, okay, so here we see <laughs> uh, the vestibular nerve traveling um, towards that medulla oblongata here and um, we are going up uh, through the thalamus to the cerebral cortex um, that looks, you know, maybe like the, um, this is balanced, so this will be the um, motor cortex. Uh, and then here we see the cerebellum. And we're also getting input from our eyeballs, so we want everything to mesh up so that we don't get nauseated. And then here's our comment. We see um, God and an angel standing there uh, going with the sensations to assign to humans. And the angel says, I don't know, boss. What say we just go with five? And let's read the six that they have here. Seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, touching, and heebie-jeebieing, <laughs> which it is a uh, it is a sense. So they say the development of the senses was a uh, um, process. <laughs> Thank you for listening and have a good day.